Chapter 4. Alpha Mates Suddenly Leah was gone and I was alone with Carol. Why did I feel so nervous? I hadn't felt that way with Leah. What was it about Carol that made me feel like a gawky adolescent on his first date? I suddenly remembered that, as a telepath, Carol could read my mind. I found myself blushing. In my desperate attempt not to think anything embarrassing, I became inundated with thoughts about Carol's magnificent body, which her pink, well-fitted tunic did little to hide. You're discovering, Carol said, that it's impossible not to think of something by trying not to think of it. In fact, the more you try not to think of my body, the more you think of it. My voice seemed to be strangled as I croaked out, I, uh, I'm sorry. You certainly needn't be. I would be sad indeed if you didn't appreciate the beauty of our bodies. With these words, Carol tugged at the top of her tunic, which caused it to fall to the floor, leaving her wondrously naked. A Carol, I gasped. Please, John, go ahead and look at my body, she said, as if I could have looked at anything else. I know it's difficult and embarrassing for you. Your being a Virgo, the virgin of the Zodiac, only multiplies your 20th century sex guilt, so you might as well deal with them right now if you're going to live comfortably in the 22nd century, Alpha. Let's see. Bathing together would be a perfect beginning for a Virgo. Um, you believe in astrology, then? I jumped at a safe topic to diminish my self-consciousness. Only as an influence, John, not as a determinant. Now, about that bath. She took my hand, and we entered the most spacious bedroom I've ever seen. The room was 30 feet square. In one corner was a huge 9-foot square pad, about a foot high, while in the opposite corner was a sunken pool 10 feet wide by 15 feet long. A couple of soft oval cushions in the center of the room faced a three-foot square video screen. Carol led me to the sunken pool, then, releasing my hand, made a shallow dive into the water. My adventurous self won a quick victory, which led me swiftly out of my tunic and into the water behind her. I found the water very warm and clear. The floor slanted down until it far into the pool, which I went to immediately. It was about eight feet deep. Carol was apparently using her PK power because a clear plastic partition slid out of the wall and completely surrounded our pool bath. There, she said, turning to me. Now we can splash till our heart's content. Let's wash each other. With these words, Carol surprised me with another PK demonstration as the floor beneath us began to slowly rise until we were standing in water that barely covered our knees. I felt very naked. A wall panel slid open, revealing two retractable hoses, one dispensing sparkling, slippery, cleansing bubbles, and the other clear water. Carol invited me to stretch out on a cushion that extended out from the shallow end of the pool. There she began spraying me with one hand while slowly lathering my body with the other. She covered every inch of my body with the utmost care. Once again, I tried not to think or feel sexually and ended up with one hell of an erection. As her hand slid over me, I listened to her softly telling me of the joys of sharing a bath with your alpha mate. She admired my shoulders and my firm abdominal muscles. When she came to my penis, she made a number of casual remarks about its aesthetically pleasing composition and its remarkable tumescence. This last was too much for me, and I broke my long silence. For God's sake, Carol, help me, I pleaded. I don't want to be sexually aroused. Well, why not? Carol promptly asked. Because... I lamely replied. It makes me feel like a child who can't control himself. Besides, I don't want to be unfaithful to Leah. Well, if you're worried about Leah, she's at ninth level, Carol said in her deep, soothing voice, as if this should immediately put my mind at rest. I mean, she continued, that Leah is so adequate that she has no neurotic need to possess any part of you, and so she could not be offended or jealous no matter what you do. But I don't, Carol interrupted. Leah asked me to help you in every way I could, and that specifically included dealing with your sexual neurosis. I'm not a neurotic, I defended vehemently. I'm a perfectly normal person. Maybe by 1976 standards, Carol replied calmly, but it's not normal in a 22nd century alpha to feel inadequate or in conflict with yourself over a perfectly normal, healthy enjoyment of our beautiful bodies. Well, I replied righteously, in 1976, I didn't take baths with girls I had only just met five minutes ago. While we were talking, Carol had finished washing me and then used the other hose to rinse. Now she handed me the hose and raised her arms above her head and began to turn slowly, seductively about. 
I took a deep breath and gingerly began to apply the sparkling bubbles while I held the hose with both hands. Carol smiled impishly. That's not how I washed you, John. Are you really afraid that you'll lose control if you touch me? Oh, hell, I exploded and began to feverishly rub the bubbles all over her satin-smooth skin. Hardly hell, Carol answered with a laugh. Feels to me more like what the 20th century might have called heaven. <laughs> she was right. I recognized my guilt-ridden, judgmental self shaking its frightened finger at me. It was so limited, so one-sided, so like a white line figure drawn on a blackboard. I erased it and began to enjoy a truly heavenly experience. I covered her with bubbles, then, with both hands, lovingly explored every delightful curve and valley. I was in no hurry and would have stayed in the bath all day if Carol had not, after some time, caused the floor to descend, taking us back down into the water. After a few minutes of splashing and playful wrestling, Carol led me out of the pool. Activating another circuit, she removed the plastic shield and emptied the pool, refilling it with fresh water. Streams of warm air quickly dried our bodies. Taking my hand, she ran and flopped across the huge pad in the corner. For the next hour, I abandoned myself to the joy of a romping, physical, and mental union with Carol. By the end of that hour, I had learned that sexual intercourse, when it is a mental intercourse as well, can open two people to a oneness that I had never thought possible. As we lay in each other's arms, I told Carol about my guilt and fear concerning pregnancy. I told her that I had not been able to freely enjoy a sexual relationship since my high school days. As I talked about my guilt concerning Valerie, I relived the most unpleasant experience of my teen years when my father had angrily denounced me for my animal selfishness. It was then that Carol told me that no female in the macro society could ever have a child without special e-mental preparation. Even then it required permission from the Deltar. I didn't understand her technical explanation of how the female reproductive cycle had been modified so that no female experienced menstruation unless she was going to bear children. However, I thought it would have been welcomed by most 20th century women and men. We talked about the macro society policy of permitting only their finest members physically, e-mentally, and spiritually, to produce children. They restricted births so that the student population was approximately 10% of the total population. When I realized how few women would ever have an opportunity to bear children, I was shocked. Carol, I asked, do you honestly feel that it's fair to deny 9 out of 10 people the right to become parents? Fair? Carol questioned, then laughed. For a moment I forgot you're from the 1970s, John. Creating and giving birth to a child was the most physically destructive ordeal a woman ever put herself through. It's no longer necessary. The incredible conceit of couples thinking the world needed little copies of themselves was just a sad symptom of Microman's limited perspective. I studied the history of Microman, Carol continued. For thousands of years, anyone could have children, and they were treated as possessions. By the 20th century, in your country, they could no longer be put to work at an early age, so the Micro family began ignoring them. The drug cults and the youth revolts of your time were partially the result of Microman's compulsion to create far more offspring than he or she were at all prepared to guide to effective adulthood. And your solution, I said, is to parentally disenfranchise 90% of your population. Oh, no, John, she said, shaking her head and giving me a wry smile. You don't understand. Anyone can have a child if they prepare themselves for this purpose. It may take a few lifetimes for some, but we're not imprisoned in one lifetime as micro-societies thought they were. Microman's motto was, you only live once, so eat, drink, and pollute, for tomorrow you may die. And of course, his frantic selfishness not only destroyed him, but almost destroyed a whole planet. I had to admit that by 1976 we had seriously polluted most of our lakes and rivers and were affecting the oceans as well. I wondered how bad it had gotten between my lifetime and Carol's. Obviously, perceiving my thoughts, she paused for a moment. Her eyes saddened as if remembering something very unpleasant. Then she continued, You polluted your oceans, your air, and your land until almost all animal and fish life was gone. Then you caused geophysical imbalances in the earth, which produced earthquakes and tidal waves so destructive that when you look at a map of our world today, you will not recognize it. Well, I said lightly, not really comprehending the magnitude of the disaster, I guess that solved our overpopulation problem. How many people are alive in the year 2150? Approximately 303 million, Carol said. There would have been a lot more in spite of the physical disasters if Microman could have at last cooperated and helped each other. 
Unfortunately, he accentuated all the traditional divisions, nationality, race, religion, language, educational, and socioeconomic levels, and fought over the fast-dwindling resources of his ravaged planet. Did Microman really become as extinct as a dinosaur and dodo bird? I asked. Almost, Carol responded. There are only about three million micro-beings in existence today, and they all live on one island, which we call Micro-Island. If anyone in our macro-society gets tired of our life, they can move to Micro-Island and live selfishly and in fear of their fellow micro-neighbors, the way your society lived in the 20th century. You mean, I said, your macro society keeps three million people on a prison island? Carol shook her head. Oh, no one ever has to live on micro island if he's willing to live in the macro society by our macro standards. You must understand that every person who lives on micro island has chosen to live there. Even the children? I asked. Yes, Carol nodded. We know that every child prior to his birth chooses his parents as well as the environment he'll grow up in. You mean, I added... You, too, believe in reincarnation? Yes, I do, Carol responded. We all do. Just as exploration of the earth proved the theory that the world was round, exploration of the mind proved the theory of reincarnation. When we explore the subconscious mind, we discovered the soul and its memory of past lives on this planet as well as in other dimensions. We learned that the first human souls to enter this planet inhabited the bodies of various animals and got trapped in animal flesh. Then other human souls decided to help their brothers by preparing a way out of this animal life trap. To achieve this, they hovered over the bodies of apes and, working with macro powers, manipulated the gland centers of the apes to change their evolutionary pattern. This is how the five races of man were produced, black, brown, red, yellow, and white, at approximately the same time in different parts of the world. As these apes developed more human-like bodies, they were used as vehicles for human souls to experience this physical dimension and to provide human bodies for those trapped in animal flesh. And there are still human souls inhabiting animal bodies? I asked. In my life in 1976, could I have met a fellow human soul trapped behind bars at our local zoo? Carol was amused by this question. Well, no, not quite. There's an evolution of souls, with some almost human souls still incarnating in other forms of life. Some of these are using mental powers that outreach those of man in specific areas. But all truly human souls, trapped in animal flesh, were free to inhabit human bodies long before recorded history began. That does not, however, mean that they are not trapped. What do you mean? I queried. I mean that in human bodies, most souls can only conceive of pleasure in the limited scope of physical existence. Afraid of giving up or losing these pleasures, they became victims of their own desires, their own limited perspective and kept incarnating again and again. In an attempt to avoid the law of karma, they tried to forget their past. They lived in a kind of delusionary amnesia. Well, I'm familiar with the concept of karma, I said. As I understand it, it's the same as the Christian concept of what you sow you must reap. Is that right? Well, essentially, yes, Carol answered, then went on to clarify. Karma, you see, reflects the macro truth that all is one, and thus anything we do to others we do to ourselves. Of course, it isn't apparent at the limited micro-perspective, so souls take refuge in micro-lives in an attempt to avoid the painful consequences of their own past actions and thoughts. This is the delusionary amnesia that I spoke of. From a purely micro-perspective, karma doesn't exist, because it's not perceived as existing. From a midpoint of evolution, karma is acknowledged as the logical explanation for one's fortunes and misfortunes. It is believed to be real, and therefore, real in its cause and effect element, real as a cause and effect element within a continuous time perspective. From a more macro view, however, time is simultaneous, and karma is understood to be a valid element of a limited perspective regarding time. Fortunes and misfortunes are seen from the broader perspective not as cause and effect, but as learning opportunities specifically and carefully chosen by each soul for its own development. Wait a minute, I interrupted. Let me go back a bit. You said that some souls try to forget their past in an attempt to avoid the consequences of their actions and thoughts. What's this about thoughts? Well, thoughts are things, you know. They are just as important as actions, Carol added. The way you think makes you what you are and profoundly influences the world around you. You mean, I said, that if I rob or murder someone, or even if I hate someone, that this will eventually come back to me? Exactly, she replied. But that's only half of it. For you see, if you are patient, helpful, or think kindly of others, these too will come back to you. The great macro-philosopher Jesus 
said that whatever measure you deal out to others should be dealt back to you in return. That's why the golden rule of treating others as you would like to be treated makes sense from a macro view, though not from a limited micro view. Another expression of the law of karma is Newton's third law. For every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This law is cumulative throughout all of one's incarnations, and there is but one escape from its effect, an applied and practiced macro perspective. I'm not sure I understand, I hesitated. What I mean, John, is that the same law applies to all experience, but it is seen and interpreted differently according to the size of one's perspective. From a macro perspective, it is seen that your conscious intent affects every cell of your body and exerts an influence on your environment. It is understood that you, and only you, are responsible for your life and what it holds. This is the great truth that will come of age in your 70s culture the most joyful, rejuvenating, hopeful insight of all. We're not the victims of circumstances, but the architects of our lives. Our conscious thoughts create an image of our lives, ourselves, our feelings, and our unconscious produces it in perfect accordance with our predominant conscious beliefs. The law, you see, remains the same in all those lives that we live. We just interpret it differently depending on our level of evolution during a particular lifetime in question. Well, I asked, if we've all incarnated so many times, why don't we remember past lives? Are you saying it's just because we don't want to remember them? That's right, she replied. People forget their past lives because they don't want to remember their ugly, selfish actions, which would humble their pride and make it impossible for them to feel superior to others. Pride is possible only when we forget our past failures. However, he who forgets his past is doomed to repeat it. To the extent that human souls deny that each person's mind is totally responsible for all that it experiences, they can only continue to repeat the same selfish actions that cause the same painful consequences. They must accept total responsibility for their entire state of being, then joyously create the life that they want if they are to facilitate evolution. She smiled and took my hand. We'll talk about that more later. Right now, let's freshen up and go have lunch got dressed and ate a delicious meal in the Alpha dining room. Their kitchen was a marvel. All one had to do to get any kind of food was turn a dial and press a button. Within a few seconds your chosen meal appeared, either hot or cold, as you selected, from a sliding panel in the wall. I had what I thought was a delicious two-pound steak, served medium rare and sizzling hot. After I'd eaten it and profusely praised the cook, Carol finishing her carrot juice, informed me that the steak was synthetically derived from high-protein seaweed combined with other vegetable ingredients. The cook, I learned, was another computer-run servo mechanism. Carol tried to explain their complicated food processing technology, but I told her not to bother since I was trying to forget that steaks weren't really steaks. She accused me of practicing delusionary amnesia to deny unpleasant reality, and I had to admit my guilt. I could still remember the delicious taste of my steak, and I knew I would enjoy my meals in 2150 if I could just forget where they came from. My major objection to a vegetarian diet was that I liked the taste of meat and felt it was the best source of protein I knew of. If the science of 2150 had solved these problems, I wouldn't fight it, even if I didn't agree with Carol that it was wrong to kill animals for food. I told Carol that I thought she and the rest of the macro society members were pretty hard on microman and his habits, However, she insisted that she did not condemn Microman or feel that she was intrinsically better than he was any more than the sixth-grade child was better than the first-grade child. It was all a matter of evolution along the M.M. for micro and macro continuum toward an ever greater awareness of the oneness of all. Besides, she insisted that she could remember many past lifetimes in which she had lived selfish micro-existences both as male and female. I wondered about this business of past lives of different sexes, but decided to bring it up later. Back in our Alpha Dyad room, I thought of it as our room now, Carol showed me the toilet facilities by activating a circuit that caused a portion of the wall and the adjoining floor to change into a very strange but remarkably convenient area for disposing bodily wastes. When I looked pained at his lack of privacy, Carol smiled and suggested I press a nearby button, which I did causing an opaque, plastic-like wall to slide completely around the area. There you are, John, she said. A way to hide that part of you which, is, which you feel is shameful. We prepared this barrier screen especially for your arrival, she teased. Here in 2150, we provide privacy for thinking, not for hiding. 
but I know that you in the 20th century were still very ambivalent about the human body and most of its basic and necessary functions. I had to agree with Carol that I was probably neurotic by 2150 standards, but I used the opaque wall and I asked her to do the same. I was pleased that she didn't resist my request. She was very accepting, easygoing. Not that she was at all reluctant to express a point of view that differed from mine, but she didn't get impatient or angry with my micro-neurotic ways or my insatiable curiosity about 2150. When I asked her about the video wall screen, she explained that it was connected with central information just like the ones in the CI room. Then she showed me some new ways of using it. We sat down in two chairs facing the video screen. Carol commanded CI to show us some news magazine material from 1970. Almost immediately, we found ourselves leaping through the pages of Time and Newsweek magazines as recorded on microfilm. Carol stopped the CI at one of the pages and asked me to read and comment on the following. Time Magazine, 7 13 70. Millions of Americans in 1970 are gripped by an anxiety that is not caused by war, inflation, or recession, important as those issues are. Across the U.S., the universal fear of violent crime and vicious strangers, armed robbers, packs of muggers, addict burglars ready to trade life for heroin, is a constant companion of the populace. It is the cold fear of dying at random in a brief spasm of senseless violence for a few pennies for nothing. And yet, Americans are several times more likely to be hurt in auto accidents or household mishaps than to be raped, robbed, or murdered. Only about 10% of robbery victims are badly injured. Fewer than 1% are killed. The nation's well-being is far more insidiously undermined by embezzlers, price fixers, micropoliticians, and organized racketeers than by muggers or car thieves. Roughly half of all serious crimes are never reported, often because numbed victims expect no help from overburdened police. Between 70 and 80 percent of police effort is spent not on crime, but on hushing, blaring radios, rescuing cats, and administering first aid. Countless additional police hours are wasted on crimes without true victims, for example, drunkenness, gambling, pornography, illicit sexual activities. Even the best police work is undone by clogged courts and punitive prisons that breed more crime. I looked at Carol and said, What can I say except that the world of the 70s was divided, not united, and couldn't cooperate enough to resolve its major social problems? Your society, Carol said, functioned in the only way it could, based on its micro-perspective of life. People can only behave in terms of how they perceive themselves and the world about them, and these perceptions are completely determined by one's beliefs or philosophy of life, which were prior to the 21st century generally unconscious. Okay, I admitted, we needed a broader perspective so we could see the larger picture. We needed a macro perspective, a perspective large enough so that we could see that the Golden Rule and Sermon on the Mount provided the best of all practical advice. Carol smiled and quoted, For whatever measure you deal out to others will be dealt back to you. Yes, I responded, but that doesn't make sense in everyday human affairs unless the individual is aware of this macrocosmic oneness. In the 1970s, Carol added, you lived in a world in which at least one out of every three people lived in abject, crippling poverty, and you people, in your proud United States, united indeed. Hmm, that's another story. You people had a welfare system so politically corrupt and inadequate that it not only ignored the worst cases of human neglect and poverty, but actually perpetuated poverty and ignorance from one generation to the next. At that time, she continues, you dedicated your major national energies and resources to war and paranoid preparations for war. If in the 60s and 70s you had devoted the same amount of money and national effort to solving your social problems that you did to waging your nation-dividing Vietnam War, you could have ended the poverty cycle forever in your country and gone a long way toward resolving many of your nation's other social problems. I know, I said, but our political leaders were ignorant, if not corrupt. Carol shook her head. Every nation deserves its leaders, she said. You're trying to avoid your own responsibility by placing blame on others. Please, John, don't think I'm sitting in righteous judgment of you or your micro-society. I don't blame you or condemn micro-man for acting like micro-man. It's the only way he can act, because it's the only way he has learned to act. But I must help you to see this broader perspective. But, I objected, how can you not condemn human beings for selfish, cruel, and even vicious behavior toward others? 
especially since that behavior became so selfish and so short-sighted that it almost wiped out our whole planet. It was the only way, Carol answered, that man could learn the consequences of his own actions. Mistakes are absolutely essential in the learning process. Besides, John, it's only terrible from a short-term micro point of view. From the macro view, it's all perfect. Everything has a purpose and a happy ending because everything is evolving toward perfect macro awareness. I know, I said, that from your macro view, we're all responsible for every experience. But tell that to someone who's suffering from poverty or disease or some other kind of human injustice. Carol smiled and said, I don't speak to children about things that they're not ready to understand. But I don't forget that in time every child becomes an adult and everyone eventually will understand everything. I decided that we had gone as far as I felt I was ready to go on this subject, so I asked Carol when I would meet our other Alpha members. She immediately asked C.I. to contact her, or should I now say our Alpha. In about 15 seconds, we heard the voice of our Alpha leader, who informed Carol that the rest of our Alpha would be back in about two hours. After Carol had thanked him for this information, she terminated their contact and told me how C.I. can contact any macro society member by using the communication cell contained in the bracelet which each of them wore. She showed me what she called her MIB, for Macro Identity Bracelet. It contained a timepiece, a communication cell, a bionic monitor, and a nutrition compartment. I was fascinated by the fact that the bracelet supplied CI with heart and brain patterns for everyone in the macro society. Any danger was immediately relayed via CI to the closest and best able to offer help, even if the person in trouble was unconscious and thus unable to call for help. Carol told me that I would soon receive my own MIB. Then she asked if I would like to see pictures of other Alpha members. Of course I did, so she asked CI to present them. Suddenly I was looking at a picture of our leader, Alan, whose voice I had just heard. At the same time, CI was telling me about him. Your Alpha leader, Alan is 20.6 years old, 6 feet 5 inches tall. This, along with his weight, was given in metric equivalents, then translated for my benefit. 240 pounds, and is presently residing in the Alpha Gamma of Delta 927. Carol interrupted CI at this point to tell me that we could listen for days to the accumulated information that CI had on every individual member of our Alpha. This information, she said, even included data on past lives. However, she felt that I probably was not ready for too much information on each member yet. It was here that she pointed out that all information on every person in the macro society was available to everyone. There was no such thing as a secret, hidden, or confidential information. I commented that my government in 1976 could not possibly function without massive secrecy. Then I looked at the videotape of Alan leading a discussion group, running, walking, swimming, playing games, and sleeping. He looked tremendously vital and intelligent. When I commented on this, Carol said he was a six, as if that explained it all. We next saw pictures of Bonnie, who was Alan's alpha mate. She was six feet two and weighed 160 pounds. Next was six foot seven Adam, with Nancy, who was six feet three. They were followed by Diane and David, who were six feet one and six feet five, respectively. Then came the tallest man of all, Steve, at six feet nine, and his alpha mate, Joyce, who was six feet three. Finally, C.I. presented pictures of Carol and John, and I realized the pictures of me had been taken while I was in the library and walking with Leah. I was impressed with the sheer physical size and beauty of my fellow Alpha members. I was also surprised at the lack of hair. Of the five males, my hair was longest, and it was short by 1976 standards. Even among the girls, the longest hair was Carol's, which was no more than four inches at most. When I asked Carol about this, she informed me that they did not value hair because they were not vain about their appearance. It was simpler, she assured me, to keep their hair short. Tell me, Carol, I asked. Are there any fat or ugly people in the macro society? She laughed and said, How could there be when we control our complete genetic, physical, and mental development of all our children? All right, but why then do you have your different levels of awareness? How come everyone isn't a level 10? Because, Carol answered, we cannot change the learning experiences of past lives. However, no soul can incarnate into the macro society who has not evolved to macro potential. Even me? Carol smiled. Oh, John, even our wisest ones could not have succeeded in helping Leah bring you here if you didn't have the macro potential. Let me try to understand these levels of awareness, I said. I'm level one because I'm a beginner at macro awareness. That's right, John. You're well on your way toward applied awareness of your oneness with all that is, all that was, and all that ever will be. 
and Adam and Nancy have demonstrated second-level awareness, I continued. You are at third level, along with Steve, while Bonnie and Joyce are level four. Then we have Diane and David at level five, Alan, our leader, at the sixth level. Now tell me, what's the difference between these levels? I'll let C.I. answer that question, Carol said. And while you're getting your questions answered, I'll go back and pick up your MIB from the administration building. I had a mental picture of the map which C.I. had shown me of the Delta and suddenly realized Carol was talking about a ten-mile round trip. You mean you're going to walk ten miles? I asked. She said, Oh, I could have it sent by underground pneumatic tube right here to our Alpha, but since I missed our exercise period today, I'll run the distance. I'll be back in less than an hour. Ten miles in less than an hour? I asked incredulously. Don't worry, John. Our macro powers help us run lighter, faster, longer, and more joyously than would ever have been possible for Microman. Don't you have any kind of local transportation? I asked incredulously. Unless it's a great emergency, Carol replied, we walk or run everywhere in the Delta, sometimes even between Deltas. Sure, we have transairs that take us very quickly anywhere we want to go on this planet, but we believe in a balanced life, free from the neurotic rushing of your micro-society. We believe in exercising the body, the mind, and the spirit equally so they can remain in balance. With those last words, she blew me a kiss and literally ran out of the room not because she was in a hurry, but from the sheer joy of exercising a magnificently healthy and vital body. I was pleased that she shared my joy in running and understood better why no one would become fat in this energetic society. Turning back to the video screen, I began asking my questions about levels of awareness and found that C.I. kept an almost total record on every person in the macro society from birth to death. This was done by means of the macro identity bracelet and the early evaluation performed by C.I., One's level of awareness was indicated by the color of his tunic. Tunic, I learned, was a perfectly accurate reflection of one's aura, which was an unfailingly accurate indicator of one's state of being, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Level 1 was predominantly gray. 2 was lemony orange for energy. 3 was pink for control of that energy. 4 was purple for empathy and leadership. 5 was violet for joyous acceptance of what is. Six was yellow for love in its most total sense. Seven was green for healing. Eight was blue for balanced use of the intellect. Nine was aquamarine for wisdom. And ten was white for leadership, the perfectly balanced blend of all other levels. According to CI, there were currently only 127 persons in the macro family who were evaluated as having demonstrated 10 degrees of macro awareness. This was out of a current macro family population of 300 million. These degrees of awareness were based on the extent to which a person demonstrated the three macro qualities of love, wisdom, and leadership, in that order of importance, and the seven macro powers, clairvoyance, telepathy, precognition, retrocognition, psychokinesis, telekinesis, and astral projection. As CI presented more and more information about the highly complex process of developing degrees of awareness, I found myself becoming very drowsy and having difficulty keeping my eyes open. Finally, I gave in to my desire to rest, closed my eyes, and was soon asleep.